just going to open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much, Lord, for uh, this group here. Father, that uh, you've enabled us to partake in, Father, your, your language, your Torah, your way of doing things. And Father, that uh, with humble hearts we come before you because there's so much that we need to learn. The more that we learn, we realize we don't know. And so, Father, that you can open up new vistas of understanding for us so that we might walk how you would have us to walk. So bless everyone here and that their ears are open and ready to receive in Yeshua's name. Amen. Well, today is January 31st, 2011. And uh, as we all sit here and as I'm standing here, it, it appears that the Middle East and parts of uh, that world are destabilizing. And of course, there's issues in Tunisia, there's issues in Egypt, uh, which has been a long time issue for the Jewish people for a long time, as well as Lebanon and, and who knows what's next, of course, Afghanistan, and we know what's going on with Iran as well. And when it comes to the, the, the word, and when we talk about the Brit Hadashah in the New Testament, the, the movement of the Torah after the resurrection of uh, Yeshua, uh, the world was destabilizing then as well, and uh, it doesn't have a recognizable face today as it did then, only it was a little bit more enlightened then, even in light of the destabilization. And that's one thing that I'm going to share with you tonight uh, about the movement of Torah, because when we talk about Torah, which the, one of the mission, part of the mission statement of El Shaddai is taking Torah to the nations. And uh, Pastor Mark did a wonderful job in the last two sessions talking about Rabbi Shaul, or the Apostle Paul, and uh, his, his background and, and certain situations that he got into. And um, his mission, too, was to take Torah to the nations. And it was part of the commission that Yeshua gave before uh, he ascended when, in Acts 1.8. He says, you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Judea, Ju Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the uttermost part of the earth. And uh, Paul had just not gotten on to the, to the bandwagon at that point. But his mission was to take Torah to the nations, and his, his writings are a very big part of Brit, the Brit Hadashah, or the New Testament. And as we begin to learn Torah, and as we come into Torah, and as we've learned it as a missing piece that we've missed for so many years, at least most of us have, uh, and then we, we, we come back and we look at the epistles and we look at the book of Acts. They seem to take on a different face than they did before. Does anybody feel that way? Okay. And that's what I'm going to chat a little bit about tonight. And I may deviate a little bit from these notes, but just hang on and just tighten your seatbelt. I think you might be able to get through it. But how many of you have studied the book of Acts before, at least read it once or twice or studied it in detail? Okay. You may see a few things that are a little bit different tonight on how we view it because, quite frankly, the epistles and, uh, can, can actually be uh, interpreted in light of the book of Acts. And that's why there's a lot of misunderstanding. When we come, for, after we've learned a lot of Torah, we come to the, 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 the Brit Hadashah and we think, man, how do we deal with these verses? And a lot of dealing with those verses is just understanding them in light of the areas that, of which they were written in and to whom they were addressed. And so the writings of the, apostles, of the apostles can be understood in the light of the book of Acts. And it holds a lot of keys to understanding that the letters or the epistles that were written. And the letters and the epistles that were written were not all written by, obviously, uh, Rabbi Shaul, which I'll refer to as the apostle Paul, but also Peter, James, John, and Jude. And then there was the four Gospels, and the four Gospels were written at a period of time after most of the eyewitnesses that were around when Yeshua was alive had died off. And that was in the latter part of the first century, or the middle to the latter part of the first century, that the Gospels were written. And the Gospels were written to show who the Messiah was, okay? And when we come to the book of Acts, the book of Acts was actually written by someone who was not an apostle, and that was Luke. And Luke was known as a physician who was also the writer of the book of Luke. And we, we know that for several different reasons, which I'm going to get into in a second. But there's, in the book of Acts, the latter part of Acts, there's some sections that are called the we sections. W-E, which refers to we, like we're going someplace. And it's Luke that is writing the narrative on this by inspiration, and he includes himself as being part of the we. 
And, but in Acts chapter one, the way it opens up is the former treaty, so the former letter, have I made, O Theophilus, which means in Greek, beloved of God. So some people think that's a, an individual's name, uh, it also, but it also means beloved of God. Of all that Jesus or Yeshua began both to do and to teach. And in Luke chapter one, verse three, which Luke obviously wrote, uh, it's very similar in its context. It seemed good to me also having had a perfect understanding of all things from the very first to write unto you in order, most excellent Theophilus, beloved of God, that thou mightest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. So there's 14 epistles, and of course the, the counting can be a little bit, there was 14 epistles by Paul, if you include Hebrews, uh, and, and, and if you count them uh, both First and Second Corinthians or First and Second Thessalonians, and eight by Peter, James, John, and Jude. But the question is, is really that we need to look at now is, is to whom are they addressed? How many of you, you know, somehow when the mail comes in your house, it goes on the counter, and if you have a family, you just hope that certain things don't get opened up, whatever happened? Well, no, you don't want anybody to open your mail. Well, there's certain things that are addressed to certain individuals, doesn't mean we can't read them, but it has certain information that's relevant to certain groups of people. And the Book of Romans is, one of the, is definitely one of those that, that varies in to whom it speaks. But let's look at who some of these are actually addressed to and, and revisit, even though you've had prior reading of, of these epistles, now take a look at it and see to actually to whom they're written. Because when we look at the, who they're addressed to, it may change some of the theology that once before you used to think. In James chapter one, it says, James, the servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. And that word scattered shows up a number of times and it means diaspora, uh, which means uh, uh, actually in the context a converted Israelite resident in Gentile countries or in the nations. It's the same word that's used uh, in James as well. In the, book of, in, in, the, in the book of James where it talks about scattered. In 1 Peter, I'm, I mean, I'm sorry, 1 Peter chapter one, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, and Bithynia. And we know from... Um, if you can turn on this PowerPoint now, that first slide for me, uh, that Peter, most of what we know about Peter is that he was resident in the Galilee and in Jerusalem. And looking on the world map here, you can see where Jerusalem is, but up here you can't really see this very well, but that's Antioch, and over here you have Rome, and that's really the whole topic. Those are the geographical centers of the book of Acts, is Jerusalem, Antioch, and Rome, and there's two Antiochs, which we'll, which we'll talk about tonight. But up in this area here, you have Cappadocia, you have Bithynia that's up here, Phrygia, uh, uh, Cilicia, uh, which the area where Paul was from. But this was the area that Peter was addressing because Peter actually visited those areas as well. And there was large Jewish populations that were in those neighborhoods. But in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1, it says, Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. So he doesn't address it specifically to any areas, but he talks about those who have like precious faith. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 3, that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. Talking about uh, individuals also that have a, a common or a like faith. Uh, Jude chapter one, Jude a servant of, of Jesus Christ, brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ. So the, it's addressed to those that are the sanctified ones. Revelation. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him, this is the Apostle John, to show unto his servants the things which must shortly come to pass. So, you know, they're addressed in certain individuals, certain areas, but certainly to the sanctified. Now, what about, how about Paul? Who were Paul's addressed to? In Romans 1, verse 7, to all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. And the word for saints is the, is the Greek word hagios, which means consecrated or set apart ones, holy one. 
So he's not only writing to a certain geographical area in Rome, but he's, he's talking about those that are set apart, that are sanctified. Same thing in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2. Unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified or set apart, called saints. Same thing in 2 Corinthians, it's the same thing. And in Galatians chapter 1, Paul, an apostle, Now this is important here because he addresses himself and he he gives certification to himself. Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. And all the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatia. If you could put that that one uh, clip back up there for me. And so up in this particular area here is the area known as Galatia. And so it's not a, it's not a real small, it's also known as a region because Paul was in that area. All of the other epistles are addressed to the saints or to the churches, the called out, with the exception of 1 Timothy, and 1 and 2 Timothy, that are addressed to an individual. And then of course Titus as well and then Philemon. And so where we pick this up now, and as I said before, Pastor Mark did a great job in giving the background of the Apostle Paul, but where he actually comes on the scene is uh, is in Jerusalem. And Paul is from Tarsus, which was in Cilicia, which was on the seacoast. And it was a, uh, it was a city of high learning. As you know, he was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. You know, there's the whole, and and, uh, it gives a whole, uh, line of where he was from, who he was a student of. He was a student of Gamaliel. Uh, Tarsus was a university town. It was really famous. It was a Roman garrison as well. And Paul was actually uh, a, f- a free Roman citizen uh, that may have been attained by his father, which I'll talk about in just a little bit. But uh, it, it's a funny thing about Tarsus. It was a place where uh, Mark Anthony had a big incident with Cleopatra. And Mark Anthony uh, thought that she was conspiring, which she probably was against him. And uh, she showed up in a ship coming up that river to Tarsus in a sailboat with with purple sails and nymphs that were all around the the boat. So it's interesting, the background and the the dichotomy of uh, government that was in uh, Tarsus at that time. And that was Paul was not contemporary with Cleopatra, but um, he was a part of that community. And so that was known, they were known in that area, you may have heard the, the word Grecians, or you may have heard the word Hellenists, because the Greeks still, even though it was under Roman control, there was still the, the Greek influence that was all over that area. And so Paul was known as a Hebrew of the Hebrews, which was, he was a Jew that still understood the old or the, the ancient language. Because a lot of the Grecians were Jews who were Greek-speaking Jews who didn't, who didn't know how to speak Hebrew. So that's why Paul was called a Hebrew of the Hebrews. And so where he comes on the scene is, uh, is quite the scene because he comes as a part of uh, consenting to Stephen's death. This is around Acts chapter seven, after the church had grown, and uh, Stephen was one of the seven that were were appointed because uh, of the daily ministration where they needed help uh, in the local community with widows and so on, and and the apostles designated these were like seven deacons, and Stephen was one of those. And in Acts 7.57 it says, as they were stoning him because he gave a dissertation uh, basically to, the, to uh, a whole group of people including Pharisees and Sadducees. They didn't like what he had to say and so they, they said it was blasphemy and he was quite bold and so they decided to stone him. And they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. And uh, Saul, one of the reasons that Saul may have been there was because there was a synagogue that was in that area, and it's actually in Acts chapter six, in verse nine, it says, there arose certain of the synagogue of the Libertines, uh, disputing with Stephen. And these Libertines were actually Jews that came from those areas that I showed you around Tarsus. The Libertines were, were enslaved at one point, and then they were set free. 
and so they were called Libertines, and there was a synagogue in that area known as the Synagogue of the Libertines. And they, and they uh, at least tradition has it that uh, Paul's father, or Saul's father, was one of those initial Libertines that was set free. And so Paul would have been a part of that synagogue that was, um, that was in, in uh, Jerusalem. And in Jerusalem, in the Talmud says that there was, uh, around that time, there was about, 400, about 450 to 480 synagogues that were in Jerusalem. And that's why it names those different, I think it even mentions Libertines in Acts chapter 2. I, I, I'm not sure, I think it does. And so uh, according to the Torah, uh, if you, there had to be witnesses, of course, if you were blaspheming, and Stephen had plenty of witnesses uh, that, that witnessed what he had to say, and so the witnesses were the ones that had to cast down their clothes and throw the first stones, and that's what they did. And Paul was, or Saul was consenting to it, and there is some say that possibly the reason he was casting, or he was giving his approval, is because he was one of the Sanhedrin himself. And there's, there's not a whole lot of proof to that, but because if you're in the Sanhedrin, you have to be at least 30 years of age and you have to have a wife and a child. But nevertheless, he was there and he gave his consent. And so Stephen was stoned with him giving the consent and that's how he came on the scene. And so in Acts uh, 8.1, it says, Saul was consenting unto his death. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church was at, which was at Jerusalem and they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. So they hung out, and basically what happened is that people began to scatter, uh, and when we talk about the, the regions of Judea and Samaria, we're talking about this area that's in here around Jerusalem, all the way up to Caesarea, uh, clo close to, uh, to Nazareth, or Nazareth. Um, and if we were to take a, car, a ride today, it would probably take about 50 minutes, those that have been to Israel, but for them, it took a day uh, or more to, if they were walking from, say, uh, Jerusalem to get over to Joppa, it was maybe a one and a half day journey. So the distances by foot uh, took quite a while, but they scattered out amongst these regions because of the persecution. Now, uh, it says in verse three that Paul, Saul, made havoc of the church. He entered into every house, hailing men and women, and committed them to prison. There, therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. So they didn't go into hiding. Instead, it really pumped up their zeal, and they went and they spoke the word, okay, even though they were under persecution. Now, when it, that word scattered is the same word that I mentioned before. It's diaspora, where they're scattered about like seed. Well, there were three great dispersions that took place over the years with the Jews. There were 10 tribes. The first one was the 10 tribes that went into Medea and Assyria, and then two tribes to Babylon. There was a second one that took Jews to Asia Minor, uh, the area of Cappadocia, which uh, is an offshoot of the Assyrian dispersion. And then there was a third Egyptian dispersion that took place under Ptolemy. And so his initial mission when Paul arrives on the scene, it's basically to get all of those believers of Yeshua uh, who were claiming Yeshua as Messiah and haul them off to prison and have them you know, either killed or uh, whatever, basically whatever he could write, get the letters written on them. And uh, actually, here is now is where it takes place where he is going to go to Damascus and he gets letters from the high priest. Now what's interesting, if you re remember from Torah, and there's a real, it's, it's amazing how God works, and it's amazing how things happen um, uh, geographically and politically that opens doors one way or the other for, for things to happen. And Damascus is one of the oldest cities that's in the world today. It's about 4,000 years old. And uh, Paul had gotten letters from the high priest to go to Damascus to the synagogues to do the same thing, to haul people, to get the, the Christians who were hiding out or if they were speaking, and to haul them off to prison. And basically what he was doing, it was like extradition. The only thing is that in Torah, now, he was, now Paul was a Pharisee and he knew the law. And they said that under the teaching of Gamaliel, when Gamaliel died, they said that the greatest essence of the law has left the earth. That, that was how high they esteemed Gamaliel, and Paul learned from Gamaliel. So Paul knew Torah. And one of the things in Torah is that 
you can't necessarily go into a country, at least the, the freshness of Torah, the purity of Torah when the children of Israel are in the land, you couldn't just go into another country and hold those people accountable that are in another land, right? Well, it just so happened that there was a window of time that, um, that enabled Paul or, the apostle or Rabbi Shul to go into Damascus, and I'll talk about that in a second. But here's his own words. In Acts chapter 9, verse 1, it says, Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to go to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And in 22, verse 4, he talks about this again. He says, I persecuted this way unto death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women, as also the high priest doth bear me witness and all the estate of the elders from whom also I received letters unto the brethren and went to Damascus to bring them which were there bound to, unto Jerusalem to be punished. So he really had a chip on his shoulder when it came to followers of Yeshua. The only thing that happened when he was on his way to Damascus, there was a slight issue that came up. How many of you have been to Damascus? How many of you, you if you've been to Israel, uh, when you're in the Golan Heights, uh, in, that, in that particular area, the West Bank, where Pastor Mark loves to take everybody, well, everybody else's hair stands up, and you can almost, you can see Damascus, uh, you know, in the distance. Does anybody know how far Damascus is from, from Jerusalem? Don't all answer at once. Okay, it was, uh, for, for Paul, and the most likely route that he took, it was about 136 miles so you know he had to be committed and he was on a mission to do what he did if he was gonna go 136 miles and drag a whole bunch of people back with him, let alone search out for him in this city to, to bring him out. Well, what happened was, is, and I love the words of Steve Lytle, Rabbi Shaul was arrested by the Holy Spirit on the road to Damascus. And um, if you could pull up that PowerPoint for me. This is basically the direction that he would have taken. He would have had to have crossed the Jordan. As you know, it's a mountainous or a hilly area up and down and uh, had to come around the other side of the Galilee and he would have come up to Damascus. But unfortunately, somebody met him there, uh, him and his group, and it turned out to be Yeshua HaMashiach. And uh, however Paul was traveling, whether he was on a horse or standing, whatever it was, it just says that he fell to the ground. And the Shekinah uh, got to him. And when he left Jerusalem, most likely left in this area, this is, anybody know what this is called in Jerusalem? It's the Damascus Gate because it faces in that direction which the caravans would leave to Damascus. And over in that direction, how many of you have seen this site before, something that looks like this? It's in the direction looking towards Damascus and that would be the terrain that Paul was on. Well, Yeshua happened to meet him and he fell off his high horse, and that's where I wonder sometimes where we get that saying, get off of your high horse. Have you ever heard that one before? And the Shekinah was so bright, there's a number of different accounts that talk about when it happened to him. Uh, some of them heard the voice, some of them didn't hear the voice, some of them saw the light, their ears were muffled, and so on, but nevertheless, Paul was blinded by it. But as he was falling to the ground in Acts 9, 5, it said, he, and he said, this is what Paul said, he says, who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Yeshua, whom thou persecutest. And it's funny because we just had in the most recent Torah portions with, uh, with who else said something like that to, Mo to Moses, to Moshe? It was Pharaoh. He said, who's he? Who's, who's, the, who's the Lord? Right? And it's funny that here's Paul who is who's supposed to be worshiping the God of his fathers and all of his zeal going to get believers in Torah and in Yeshua, and he has to ask, who, who are you? Who are you, Lord? Well, Pharaoh asked the same question. And then he asked this question in verse six, and trembling and astonished, he said, Lord, what will you have me to do? So here's a guy that's all, you know, he, he's all worked up, he's all enthused about what he's doing, he's got a lot of zeal, and he, here he is, he's, got, he's in a shocking moment. And he said, Lord, what will you have me to do? And so they led him by the hand to Damascus, and he went to what was known as the house of Judas. 
uh, which, a man, uh, which a ma- another man, a believer, was told by the Lord to go and see Paul. Uh, and he, stayed, he was in the house of Judas, he was blind, and, and I would say that those were probably the darkest 72 hours that Rabbi Shaul had. Because who knows what happened and went through his mind during those 72 hours. Now Paul talks about the account in a number of a number of other places in the book of Acts and also in the epistles. And so in verse 8 it says uh, that Saul arose from the earth and when his eyes were open he saw nobody. And they led him by the hand, brought him to Damascus, and he was there three days without sight and neither did he eat or drink. So he was, Paul was wasted. Now, Ananias' mission to Saul was a little bit different because he was a little shaken up himself because he knew about what had happened uh, with, with Saul and what he was doing. So in 9.15, the Lord said to him, go your way. He says he told Ananias to go see Paul for he's a chosen vessel unto me. And he tells him the mission which he, he also told Paul himself which is, is that he was going to be a chosen vessel to bear my name before the Gentiles, the kings, and the children of Israel. Now, here's where it really gets interesting when you look at the impact of the Lord's visitation on a person's life. Because in Acts chapter uh, 9 and verse 19 is where we begin to see uh, the impact and the chorus that Paul takes from here. You know, a lot of times we'll read things and we don't know where certain events happen in the middle of verses. And remember, who wrote the book of Acts? It was Luke, okay, who was a companion in travel with Paul. But Paul also mentions different things in the epistles that gives more insight to these verses. And in, and in uh, chapter 9, verse 19, on the first part of the verse, it says, and when he had received meat... He was strengthened. And that is, that's that very first part of the verse. And then I know it says, then Paul Saul was certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus. Well, there's additional information in this in Galatians. In Galatians chapter 1, verse 15, it says, But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen, Immediately, I conferred not with flesh and blood. Now, do you know, you know what the word immediately means? It means like right now, immediately, okay? So Paul's life, when I say he was arrested by the Holy Spirit, his life was turned around like booms quick. And so I'm sure he wasn't, oh yeah, the Lord told me I'm gonna go, let's see, let me write that down. Uh, I gotta get my day timer, Lord, so how do I, when should I, what date do you want me to do? Paul was thinking about, his credentials, he was thinking about his career. He was thinking about how am I gonna explain this to the folks at home? What do I do if I go back to Jerusalem? Who is this guy anyway? And so Paul had gone through a lot of changes. And so here in Galatians it says that immediately he conferred not with flesh and blood. Now when we read Torah, how often, other than the sacrifices, do do you see terminology that comes up that deals with the flesh? How often? Hardly ever. I mean, I looked it up, so I know. But when we look at when we look at the epistles, and you look at Romans, and you look at Galatians, and you look at Ephesians, flesh comes up a lot of times. Walk, walk in the, uh, walk by the spirit and not by the flesh. Okay, Uh, it's all over Romans now. Where did that come from? Is this a new theology that Paul just came up with and he came up with the words flesh and spirit? Well, this is the first time that he talks about it. Immediately he conferred not with flesh and blood. We know from Torah when it talks about uh, the two natures, uh, particularly in the area of say Lashon Hara, we're talking about uh, Yetzer Hara and Yetzer Tov, which is the, the evil intention and the good intention, okay? Which you, which you might know as flesh and spirit. Okay, and so Paul, in the introduction in the epistles, that's where that basically comes from. But in Galatians, this is what he's saying, man, I didn't get into any of my intentions. I split right away, and he had to get away because he didn't know what to make of himself or what had happened. And it says that he went into Arabia. And then it says he returned again to Damascus. Well, how long he was in Arabia... 
And, and can you put that slide back up for me with the map? Arabia, and this isn't a real good, but Arabia is in this area, could be all the way down to Petrich because it was how it was defined. It could have been any of this area here. Uh, and where he went and how long he was there, nobody really knows, although it gives a little bit of a hint of what it could be because of what I'm going to read here in a little bit. But he finally comes back, and he comes back to Damascus. He does, Why didn't he go back to Jerusalem? <laughs> because he was probably going to get his head cut off. But in 19b, the second part of 19, it says, Then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus. And in verse 20 it says, And straightway, you know what straightway means? That means like he got right into it, okay? So he went into Arabia, he spent some time there. How long? You don't know and I don't know. We have a hint. But he goes, in, he goes back to Damascus and now he's charged up. And somehow he has a change, his polarity changes. And immediately he goes into the synagogues and starts preaching about Yeshua. That he is the son of God. In verse 22, it says, Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is the very Mashiach, or this is the very Christ. And after that, many days were fulfilled, the Jews took counsel to kill him. So finally, as, as word starts to get around, and as he's spending his time preaching on street corners, finally the guys that, that he, was on the, he was on the same side are start coming after him. And now they're looking to kill him. And what, there's an interesting key on this. I'm not going to go on it right now. But after, it says after that many days, many days there's a place in the Torah that refers to many days. And it, uh, it actually gives a reference to it being about three years. Okay. So after that many days were fulfilled, the Jews took counsel to kill them. And this, this, it says, was that this was during the time who was in uh, control at that time of Damascus was somebody by the name of Aretas. And in Acts 9.24, it says, but their lying wait or their laying wait was known of Paul, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. And then the disciples took him by night, and they let him down by the wall in a basket. Now, here's what's interesting First of all, this was humiliating for this to happen to Paul. During that period of time, this individual whose name was Aretas, who was in charge of, of uh, Damascus at that time was considered like a border town to Israel, but it wasn't under Israel's control except for that period. Now, Aretas was possibly, or they say probably, it was Herod's father-in-law and made, decided to make war with Herod because he abandoned his daughter for his brother Philip's wife, Herodias. Does that name ring a bell? Okay, and so he was willing to do the Jews a pleasure, and one of those was to, to grab this guy, Paul. And so in 2 Corinthians, with the additional insight, in Damascus, the governor under Aretas, the king kept the city of the, Dam the Dam Damascenes, or Damascenes with a garrison, desirous to apprehend me. And through a window in a basket was I let down by the wall and escaped his hands. Now Aretas, he was, listen to this, he was the fourth, and this, may not, this might seem like a bore, uh, boring historical fact, but it's important. He was the fourth, I'm talking about Aretas, of his dynasty, and he reigned from 9 BCE uh, to 40 CE, the Common Era. And he died between the death of Tiberius and the middle of the reign of Claudius, who engaged in war in 48 CE, the Common Era. So actually, Damascus was under Roman administration in 33-34 CE of the Common Era. So if that was true and it was still under Roman control in 33-34, Paul would not have been able to go in and do what he did. But what had happened was is that there was another emperor who came into power at that time whose name was Gaius, who, whose name was also, does anybody know? It's Caligula, and he was a maniac. But he had this thing for, for princely reign. He liked to have princes in these different provinces. And so for a short period of time when Caligula was in reign, this guy Aretas, who was actually a prince or a king in Arabia, was given control over Damascus, which opened up that window for Damascus to be under the reign of Israel for a short period of time, and Paul went in to get the, the Jews out of Damascus. Isn't that amazing? 
and it was arrested by the Holy Spirit at the same time. Now, Paul finally goes back to Jerusalem because he's got to get out of Dodge or Damascus. And in verse 26, it says, when Paul or Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed or he tried to join himself to the disciples, but they were all afraid of him. And they didn't believe that he was a disciple. Okay, now we read the Galatians record in chapter one and verse 18, where he gives this information. And he says, after three years, I went up to Jerusalem, and this is talking about after he conferred, didn't confer with flesh and blood, and he went into Arabia, and he came back. And then now, after three years, it says, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him for 15 days. Now, Peter is an important part in this whole thing. Number one, he was with, he was with the Lord for a period of time. So he knew, he knew Yeshua. And so Peter, Paul, has had his own experience as well without any influence from anyone else that was with Yeshua. His experience was with Yeshua himself, okay? And so he comes to Peter, and what happened during those 15 days is unknown, but those 15 days is what sets up Peter for another incident that happens after that. And why was it that, that Peter, that Paul, uh, was only there for 15 days. Well, in verse 19, it says, other of the apostles I didn't see except James, the Lord's brother. Still with me? Now, how did Paul get any certification at that point? Well, somebody came along who was a believer, who was, who was mentioned in the beginning of the book of Acts, Barnabas, and it says in verse 27, and this might be, verse 27, it says, Barnabas took him, and I think this is an ax, I probably didn't give you the right reference, but it says, Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. And number one, he declared unto him how he had seen the Lord in the way. And then number two, that he had spoken to him. And then number three, and how he preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Yeshua. So those were, that was Paul's certification to at least give the apostles or those that, that were in charge that, hey, this, this guy does have credentials. And you know, there's people today that don't believe that the epistles are, are inspired. They don't, they say, what, Paul, what right does Paul even have to write epistles for us to believe anything in the inspiration? Well, Paul certifies that to himself. He said, because in, in Galatians 1, he says, I didn't receive this from man, neither was I taught it, but I received it by, by revelation from Jesus Christ. Okay, so that's really the line where we're, so we have to stand at ourselves. Do we believe what Paul said? Did he, really, did he really meet Yeshua on the road to Damascus? Well, I'll tell you what, the guy sure got pretty charged up and sure made a 180 when he had everything going for him on the other side of the fence, see? And, you know, it wasn't just this little thing where, where one day he's stoning Stephen and then bringing people to prison and then, you know, he, he turns around and he's preaching about Mashiach. Haven't it, hasn't it been that way for many of you? You know, hasn't that happened with you? Twice? <laughs> the first time when you were saved, you know, when you first learned about Jesus Christ? Uh, you know, I, when I was in, you know, I was in college, and, and, and when I heard the word, I, it just, it was unbelievable. I hadn't heard anything like it. And so I had all my friends and I, oh, you know, all my best buddies, you know, oh, boy, they're going to, man, wait till they hear this. Come to this meeting. And they just, they didn't seem to be as excited as I was. And, um, you know, one by one, they just kind of dropped off, you know. And then, of course, you have to deal with your family. Isn't it the same thing, you know? And that was the first time. Then the second time when we found out that we put a piece of the puzzle aside and now we just come into it again and the pieces are coming together. And then they're saying, you what? Are you a Jew? <laughs> right? So I mean, you begin to feel like a top after a while, you know, spinning around. And this is what happened to Paul. It wasn't just a you know, one, two, three thing. There was years involved here. And Barnabas, in Acts 4.36, whose name was Joseph, who, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which is interpreted the son of consolation or the son of comfort. 
And he was a Levite, and he was of the country of Cyprus. Cyprus was not in Jerusalem, okay? So he was part of the dispersion of those of the diaspora that was scattered out. Well, what happened next? In Acts 22, 17, and this is, this is uh, what happened, what Paul is saying. He said, it came to pass when I was coming again to Jerusalem, even while I prayed in the temple, I was in a trance, or he got a vision, and saw him saying to me, and who do you think was, who, who it was? It was Yeshua again. And he said, make haste and get quickly out of Jerusalem, for they will not receive thy testimony concerning me. Now, let me ask you this. What was Paul doing in the temple? Well, he had access to it. He was a Pharisee, <laughs> okay? So he didn't, you know, he, he didn't go to Damascus. That's it, that's it, the temple's done with, it's all done away with, Jesus met me and told me all about it. The only thing is he goes back to the temple and he's praying in the temple. So how did that happen? And Yeshua said to me, depart for I will send you far hence unto the Gentiles. And so you see, sometimes the initial word that we get from the Lord, it doesn't happen until years later. So it's not worth being impatient, is it? Because at some point, and, and you know, Hashem, he orchestrates the events, so we might as well just let him set up the signpost and just follow him. You agree with that? Yeah. Well, and how the, now when he was in Jerusalem, before he left in Acts 9, 28, it says he was with them coming in and going out at Jerusalem. And he spake boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus. And it says he disputed against the Grecians. And the Grecians, well, why would he dispute with the Grecians? Because the Grecians were Greek-speaking Jews. So they weren't real hip to what he was talking about, okay? Uh, and also, where it talks about this going, coming in and this going out, uh, it's actually a Hebraic manner of life. In Acts 1.21, it says, uh, when it was talking about uh, Yeshua and, and uh, different people that were his disciples, it says, wherefore of these men who have accompanied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us. And in fact, in Deuteronomy 28.6 in Torah, it says, blessed shalt thou be when you come in, and blessed shalt thou be when thou goest out. So during that period of time that Paul was there, he was with them coming in and going out of Jerusalem for those, that, that period of time, that 15 days, and then finally the Lord said, okay, that's it, you're, you're leaving. And in verse 30 of 9.30, it says, Acts 9.30, it says, when the brethren knew, they brought him down to Caesarea, and then they sent him forth to Tarsus. And this is where in Galatians chapter one you pick up the rest of the narrative. Are you following these historical records here? Have I lost you completely? That's why you got the notes here. Uh, how these events fit in here. And in Galatians 1.21 it says, afterwards I came into the regions of Syria and Cilicia and was unknown by face unto the, unto the churches of Judea which were in Christ. Well, what was Peter doing at this time? In Acts nine after Peter is in Lydia and Saron, and he takes up residence in Joppa. If we could bring up that next slide. Okay, if, I don't know if you can see this or not, but uh, here's litter right here in this area up here, and you can't see the print, but it says the plains of Saron. And here's Joppa, and this is about a day and a half walk to Joppa. Caesarea, those of you who've been to Caesarea, where Herod had his, uh, his little camp there, was up in this area. And this is where Peter took residence, and that's where Peter, if you remember, had a little bit of a vision. Lydda was a town in Ephraim, and it was a scene that Peter had. It was a healing of a paralytic, Aeneas, and it was, it's about nine miles east of Joppa. Well, maybe not a whole day's walk, but maybe a half a day on the road uh, from the seaport to Jerusalem. It was also the seat of certain uh, individuals that were in the Sanhedrin. And then we know from while Peter was in Joppa, is where he had the little encounter and he was told uh, uh, to go to a certain individual's house by the name of Cornelius, remember that? And that's where he finds out and he gets his head twisted around because the Gentiles received Holy Spirit and were baptized. And, Paul, and how Peter relays that uh, is that he says in Acts 10, 34, then Peter opened his mouth and he said, of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation that fears him and works righteousness is accepted with him. 
And the word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. And so what was the result? In Acts 11.1, 1, it says, the apostles and the brethren that were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. So the word got back to Jerusalem, and now Peter's on the hot seat because he's got to go back and to explain what happened. And so Peter goes back, and he gives his account. And in verse 18, it says, when they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, then has God also to the Gentile, Gentiles granted repentance unto life. And so the result of the scattered believers is what you have here. If you could bring up that next slide for me. I'm in the home stretch again. Jerusalem, okay, Joppa is somewhere over here, Nazareth. Uh, this is the area of Syria. Damascus would be over in this area. Here's Antioch, Tarsus, where Paul is from. Cyprus, where who's from? Barnabas is from Cyprus, okay. Uh, and then, of course, you have here what's known as Asia Minor. There, here is Cyrene, which is quite a distance away. But what was the result? In Acts eleven nineteen, it says, Now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen traveled as far as Phoenix and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none but unto the Jews only. So they weren't preaching to, I mean, look at how far these guys were going. I mean, that's, those, these are long distances but they were only preaching to the Jews. So the word hadn't really gotten out yet. It wasn't like they, you know, Peter took out his Blackberry and he goes, okay, you, you know, and send out the word. It just didn't happen. It took a while for that word to get around. And some of the men of, of Cyprus and Cyrene, which these were areas, Cyrene was on the north coast of Africa, uh, which was populated with Jews, which when they were come to Antioch, spoke unto the Grecian, Grecians preaching the Lord Jesus. And now, as I'd mentioned before, there's two Antiochs. There's an Antioch in Syria, which became Paul's and Barnabas' headquarters, and then there's an Antioch in Pisidia, which is right up in here, and I don't know why it's not showing up there, but Antioch, there it is. Antioch of Pisidia is up in this direction. So these guys came all the way up, and they came to where Antioch was. And what was the result of that? Well. In Acts 11.22, it says, Tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church were in Jerusalem, and they sent forth Barnabas that he should go as far as Antioch. So Barnabas was definitely a trusted individual amongst the apostles. And what they did was is they sent him all the way up here up to, uh, to Antioch, which was about 16 miles from the coast. And, uh, but before he went there, he went to Tarsus, up in this area here to get Saul or to get Paul. And in verse 26 it says, when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. Now Paul's had a little bit of time here to get his act together. And he's, he's, becomes, he's preaching his way around and he's getting the word out. Barnabas goes to get him and there's a connection here that I'm gonna tell you about in a minute. It just shows you how family works, how word gets around. Barnabas takes Paul or Saul, and brings them to Antioch, and that becomes their headquarters. And it says, man alive. And it says that uh, came to pass a whole year they assembled themselves with the church, and they taught much people. And the disciples were first called Christians first in Antioch. Now, it says here that the disciples were called Christians. didn't say that the Lord called them Christians. And... Um, you know, it doesn't say that Paul or Barnabas called them Christians. It says that they were called Christians. And tradition has it that it was the, pa it was the, the heathen or the pagans that named them Christians. But in all of the texts, the, the, the word is ac actually Christians. C-H-R-E-S-T-I-A-N-S, which is not Christian. And it, it meant they had, the Greeks had no word. They had no word for it. And there's only three places in the whole Brit Shah that mentions Christian. And that's here. And also in Acts 22, I believe, or 24, when Agrippa addresses him and says, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian, and then in 1 Peter, where uh, Peter mentions it. But it's the word Christian, it's in every text. It wasn't a mistake. And they didn't know what to do with these guys that, that were talking about Yeshua HaMashiach or the Christ. 
And so this word Christian, it kind of referred to, uh, to, to a Messiah or an anointed Messiah. And so Acts 12 is a pinnacle point. Um, and it actually in the Greek, ho Christos is what comes from the Septuagint. And it's the word that refers to, to Messiah. But Acts 12 becomes a pinnacle point when Peter is imprisoned. James, the brother of John, is killed. And Acts 12, you can mark in all of your Bibles when it comes to dating, Acts chapter 12 happened in 44 CE of the Common Era. It's when Herod Agrippa died in the seventh year of his reign, according to Josephus. He began to reign in 37. You add seven years to that, it comes to 44 CE. Now, when Peter was released from prison, or by, remember by the angel, the angel goes in. Peter didn't know what was going on. The angel comes in, opens the door, and says, get out of here. Goes out into the street. And he ends up in a house where people were praying. And it says that these were the days of unleavened bread. And the believers were together and they were praying for Paul. Remember Rhoda came to the door? So, so it was Peter and... <gasps> and they didn't believe her? Well, it happened to be John Mark's house, okay, who shows up later on the scene. And this is where the itineraries of Paul come in, which I don't have a lot of time to get into this, but that's where your understanding, and, and may, perhaps Pastor Mark will get into this later, or, or I will, but this is where we're gonna begin to understand the terminology, if I don't finish this out, the terminology that's in these epistles. Because the rest of the book of Acts deals with three itineraries, or as they're called, missionary journeys that Paul took. Some people combine the third journey with his trip back to Rome when he gets imprisoned. But nevertheless, there were three separate itineraries that Paul took, and they were ordained to do this by the Holy Spirit. In Acts 13.1, it says, there were at the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon that was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean that had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and they ministered to the Lord and fasted, and the Holy Ghost said, separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I've called them. And when they fasted and prayed, they laid their hands on them, they ordained them, and they sent them away. And so, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, they departed into Seleucia, and from thence into Cyprus. And I showed you that picture, if you bring that back one more time, and I think I can wrap this up without losing everybody here. But uh, from where they were right here, okay, they came back down and they went over to, uh, to Cyprus. And the first itinerary deals with, this is where they met Elimaeus the sorcerer. And then they travel up and they go into the different regions. I'll show you this in a second. And when they loosed from Pathos, uh, which was at the other end of this island, okay, they had with them... John Mark, who was their minister. The word for minister is the word huperitis. It means an under rower. So they were with him to help, to kind of help be the steward with them and help him along, you know, in ministering and different things that they were doing in this itinerary. And John Mark splits. Okay, he left the work. And at a later point during uh, one of the, the next itineraries to come up, the second one, uh, after the council at Jerusalem, uh, there's a disagreement between Barnabas and Paul because Barnabas wanted to take John Mark. And Paul said no because he, did, he split with us from pathos and he didn't go on with the work and he didn't count him as faithful. And so Barnabas split too. And he went back to Cyprus and that's the last you hear of Barnabas um, in the rest of the book of Acts. Nevertheless, and I'll try to skip through some things here. Just real quick, this first itinerary, you can see where they went here, and I, I, you'll recognize some of them, but this is where all of these incidents that fit into these itineraries, it's not like it's just one long record. They took off from Antioch and went through the island Pathos, all the way up through Pamphylia, Pisidia, uh, Lystra, and Derby, and you've heard of these accounts. This is where Antioch of Pisidia was, and then came all the way back, and then sailed all the way back to Antioch. And then the second itinerary, it was, you could see that they started, their outreach started to get bigger. Now Paul had a different traveling company that was with him. And the same thing, they started out from Antioch and went through, uh, this time by land, Lystra and Derby, and they were basically uh, breaking new ground, you know, about Philippi, and they went into Corinth, 
and Ephesus, and, they, and this is where a lot of the believers began to first hear about Yeshua HaMashiach, and uh, not only for the first time, but there were other people on his first trip here that he confirmed those believers, and then there was ordaining of elders and so on and so forth. And in between here, which I don't have time to go into, and I'm sorry, I could, wish I could say like Pastor Mark, I have to stop here and I'll pick it up next week, but that's not gonna happen. <laughs> But I do want to say this, because there was a council at Jerusalem, and I'll have to let that one go for right now, but this is towards, should be towards the very end of your notes. On the very third itinerary, or missionary journey, you can see he takes off again from Antioch, back confirming the disciples, Troas, Philippi, Corinth, and then all the way back, and then uh, they, they actually combine it, and they say, well, this is when he went back to Jerusalem, and then it starts another journey where he goes back and he's imprisoned, he goes to Rome. And those are all of the different things that happen. That's what the whole rest of the book of Acts is about. Now, here's what I wanna close with. And this is the common thread through all of this, and this should be the last part of your notes on the last page. In Acts 26, verse six, and I apologize for going over. You never know, you just got so much stuff. In Acts 26, verse 6, Paul, in one of his defenses here, he says, and now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made of God unto our fathers, unto which promise our 12 tribes, instantly serving God day and night, hope to come. Now this is towards the end of the book of Acts, and this word for 12 tribes is the word dodeta kafulon, and dodeca means 12, fulan means tribes, but they're all, it's all one word, okay? So Paul is referring to the 12 tribes, he's referring to them all as one. He's not talking about 10 that are here, 10 tribes that are here, or two that are over here, or some that went up into England, or, or you know, that are in a desert in New Mexico, or something like that. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not stepping on somebody's foot here that just gave me a whiz jack. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. But I mean, this Paul talks about the 12 tribes and he talks about them being as one. And he says in 15.8, now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. And then in verse nine, that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy as it is written, for this cause I will confess thee among the Gentiles. And he also says in 1513, now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. So the Holy Spirit has a big part in this. And in verse 16, that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ. Now he's gonna be a minister of Jesus Christ who was Jesus Christ? He was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. So now Paul is saying in this verse, I'm a minister of him. His ministry was to the circumcision to confirm the promises made unto the fathers, and I'm doing the same thing underneath him. Ministering the gospel of God that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Ghost. The key is there's two different words for minister. Where it talks about Yeshua being a minister, it's the word diakonos, which means a servant. He was a servant to the circumcision. When Paul talks about the minister here, this word uh, is letorgos. It's made up of two Greek words, laos, which means uh, other, other nations, and uh, an ergon, which is a, is, is a service or it's a work, and it means to minister as a priest to a people other than your own. So here was Paul, groomed from the very beginning, thought he was doing the right thing, arrested by the Holy Spirit. Who could have been better than what he did? Because he not only had a knowledge of the Grecian world, a knowledge of Torah, okay, so that he was able to bring the word not only to Jews only, but also to the Gentiles, a people that were not his own. And so here we all are. Because Yeshua is our cornerstone. So let's all stand. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, thank you for calling us. Thank you for your mercy and your favor and your compassions that uh, fail not 
Uh, Lord, we never really know why things happen in our lives at any given point, and some of us here younger, just teenagers or young adults, peop- some of us, Lord, in the sunset years of our life. And Father, all along there's signposts and we go through these things, Father, and we, we may not know why we're experiencing, but you know why, to bring to pass those things that, um, that you desire in these last days, and we're privileged to be a part of it. And thank you, and, and bless Pastor Mark tonight, and Vicki, and his mother. Bring them home safely, Father, that your will be done on that trip, and bless everyone here in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. Did you learn a little, just a wee bit? <laughs> Thank you. God bless. Thank you for studying with us today. If you have any questions regarding the material discussed, please contact me at my email address. It's pastormark at elshadiministries.us. Be blessed and shalom.